Welcome to tea time. You know what that means. It's storytelling time and words. That's what we do in this house. We do not serve a beverage. If you do drink tea, yes, you can enjoy your cup of tea as well. We That's an extra bonus of tea. But before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. We're going to get you to subscribe to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. And we're going to get you to ring that little doorbell so you can get notified when all these tea times are live. If you'd like to join the live conversation and live stream while we're streaming, you are more than welcome to leave your comments, support, and questions in the comment section. If you would like to stay anonymous and not let anybody know who you are at this time, you can also DM Miss Liz on her Facebook page and I will get those questions out to our guests today. Today in the house, I have the incredible Susan Carla May in the house and we're going to be talking about her son's story of a heart transplant and the importance of organ donors. Um, we're going to get really uh, deep on that and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other stuff that she does as well. So we're going to spill a good strong tea with you today. The tea today is tenaciously um, encouraging owner donors and acceptance. That's the tea that we are serving today in the house. Um, so let's get started with the disclaimer bio and let me get Susan in here because she's patiently waiting in the studio in the back and then we're going to spill some good strong tea together. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes. And we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. Again, all tea time shows originally dates are Thursdays, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see a tea time on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it is a rescheduled special or surprise tea time. That's how Miss Liz rolls. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, I have the incredible Susan Carlisle May in the house. Susan May love, love affair with books began when she made a bad grade in math in the sixth grade. Not allowed to watch TV until she brought the grade up. Susan filled her time with books she turned her love of reading into a love of writing. Her book, Nick's New Heart, 30 Years and Counting, is about her son's heart transplant experience, which we'll be talking about today. Additional nonfiction books she has published are daily inspirations from the unflappable substitute about her 20 years in the public school system and a historical bi biograph biography bio bio We'll just skip that one. Called a WW uh, WW War II flight surgeon story is available under S. Carlisle May. Writing as Susan Carlisle, she has completed more than 35 books for Harper Collins Har Harlequin Medical Imprint line. Her heroes are strong, vibrant men and the women that challenge them. She has also independently published a number of romances. She lives in Georgia with her husband of over 40 years, and they have four grown children and eight grandchildren. Susan loves cal castles, traveling, cross-stitching, and reads ver vercaciously. I hope I'm saying that right. If not, I would get that word out there as well. My tongue sometimes, guys. So let me get Susan in here, and let's spill some tea together. Welcome, Susan. Hey, how are you? 
I am not too bad. I am so sorry for any mispronunciation. My tongue sometimes does that. No worries happens to me all the time. <laughs> so Susan, I'm going to take you way back. Who was Susan as a little girl and who's Susan now? Ooh. I don't know that I've changed that much, but um, a little girl, I was happy, had uh, two happy parents um, and um, excellent parents and two, two younger brothers. And therefore, I am um, the oldest and um, I still uh, maintain that I like to have control of things and and I'm a I I don't want to say an authority those are kind of can be in the negative words but I'm most de I'm dependable and and was then and still am so uh I haven't uh I haven't changed a great bit uh deal other than maybe my hair color <laughs> <laughs> and when age that happens right <laughs> yeah that just sneaks up on you yeah <laughs> So Susan, let's let's dive right into today's topic, and it is your son's story, uh, Nick's new heart. Uh, so let's talk about Nick's heart. Um, Nick is my youngest of four children. If he had been born three weeks earlier, I would have had four children under the age of four. So I had a lot of little kids all at uh, one time, which has turned out in as they've gotten older is really nice. Because they're all, you know, close and and uh, uh, are doing the same things in life. And, but uh, we had no idea that Nick was going to be born with a bad heart. I had a, a very nice uh, pregnancy. In fact, uh, better than some of the others. And um, and he surprised us and, and came um, with a bad heart. I did not know it initially. Back then, 35 years ago, uh, almost 36 years ago, they didn't do ultrasounds uh, routinely. You didn't get to know, you know, uh, the sex of your child and, and all of that sort of stuff. So there was no reason for us to know that he was going to have a bad heart. And um, when he was about 12 hours old, the doctor Call me back to the neonatal um, ICU. He had been moved there because they knew something wasn't right and told me that Nick, something was wrong with his heart and that they were going to take him to uh, what was then called Eggleston Children's Hospital in Atlanta. It's Children's Health Care of Atlanta now. And um, he went off in an ambulance and I stood in a window and watched he and my husband go. And oh. um I was not released from the hospital till the next day, uh, went down and I remember telling my mom, I said, no matter what's wrong with Nick, um, there'll be other children worse than he is. But um, that turned out to be wrong. Um, uh, children with cancer had a better chance of survival than he did. And oh, yeah, when he was, um, he had his first heart surgery when he was five days old. And um, your heart's about the size of a walnut. So think of doing um, heart surgery on something that tiny and uh, vessels and stuff the size of, of threads. And um, he um, had what was called a Norwood procedure, went on and um, had uh, another heart surgery when he was three and a half months old. And that time he almost died on the operating room table. And they were trying to go through his side so they wouldn't have to um, put him on um, the heart lung machine. And he didn't, ha he wasn't standing in the procedure, flipped him over and opened him up on uh, his chest again. So when he was returned to us, he had a, an incision all the way down his, the front of his chest and a long incision under um, his right arm. And, um, uh, during that um, that surgery, he also uh, they nicked the nerve to his di diaphragm, and he spent six weeks on a respirator in ICU. And um, my oldest one started uh, kindergarten that year, and I would drop uh, the oldest one off at kindergarten, drive the two and a half hours to the hospital to visit with Nick, 
um, see him and then drive home and pick the one from kindergarten up from school. So I did that for three weeks. And um, then when Nick was a year old, he had another heart surgery. And then when uh, just before he turned two, he received a heart transplant. So um, that he had a, a lot going on. At 19, he had a um, infection on his aorta, which where it's the first place is where they did the original surgery and had to have a new aorta and uh, went on to have a heart transplant. And last year, he had um, a cancer. And um, it's a kind of, uh, uh, only 2% of all transplanted patients ever get this kind of cancer. And it's from taking immunosuppressant medicine um, all of his life. So um, he, we've been busy <laughs> for 35 years. <laughs> So, Susan, what was the, the name of the heart issue with Nick's heart? He had a hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is means that you're missing part of your, um, uh, ha technically half of your heart. He was missing the left side, which is even more um, uncommon. There, it's uncommon in general to be a hypoplast, but to have a left side of your heart missing is the most uncommon. And your left lower ventricle or, or chamber is your main pumping station for your heart. And his was um, was comp almost completely missing. So um, he had out of the six heart birth defects that you can have uh, or major ones, he had five problems. He had a um, he had hyperplast. He had cortation, which is a narrowing in the blood vessel. He had a, um, na a narrowing in his aorta, had a hole in his heart, and he also had transposition, which is when your um, the blood that goes to uh, your body and the blood that goes to your lungs, when those vessels are swapped, um, he had that as well. So he was um, of the most severe heart problems you can have. He had multitudes of it. It was completely wow. messed up. Yeah. So Susan, as a mom, how did that feel? Ooh, it, uh, devastating. I, I, the, when we got to the hospital, my husband uh, took me over into a corner of the lobby of the hospital and told me that Nick's heart was bad and that um, he had agreed to, for Nick to have surgery, which I agreed with him, that, but um, that he had, you know, just um, a very small chance to survive. And it was truly devastating. It, uh, it just, you know, I, I had no, I had no idea of heart trouble outside of old men having heart attacks. You know, the children to have heart trouble was uh, almost unheard of. There was a boy that had, um, when I was in high school, that I can remember somebody talking about said, oh, he had he has some kind of heart problem. And he was tall and he was really, really thin. But, you know, it wasn't something he talked about. It wasn't something that he showed his scars or, um, you know, that it, it wasn't ever really much said about it. And so that was all of my knowledge. And I had to think back to remember that boy. So, so how, many, was, uh, how many surgeries, uh, Susan, did Nick have? Nick's had five surgeries and um, five open heart surgeries. Yeah. And he has a pacemaker. Um, he's had um, the last time we counted, he had um, 28 or 29 uh, scars. And um, he um, has, uh, but... Um, and various other, he's had that many heart surgeries, but he also had a jaw surgery. He's broken an arm, you know, those kind of things, too. So um, he, uh, we, we kind of take surgery as an everyday thing around here, and that's awful, isn't it? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you doing today? I'm doing a surgery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's really unfortunate now that I say that out loud. <laughs> But you have to take the positive side, right? It, it happened okay. so much that you had to you had to look at it in a, a light way, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, uh, people say, "Well, how do you survive? How did you live through it?" And all. Uh, what was the alternative? I, I I didn't. I mean, you just plug along and do what you have. You know what you have to do, and and. Um, that's that's still what we do um it just uh you just make the best of what you've got at the time and i think i being thankful that's it just you're thankful for 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 the the minutes you have and the time you have and 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 take them and and absorb them and and treasure them that's the only thing you can do um because uh and I think that it didn't have to be anything as dramatic as a child having a heart transplant. I think that's just what we need to do in general. Um, yeah. and worry less about what we don't have or 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 how it could be different and uh, be more accepting of what we do have and treasure what we do have. You know. So I, Susan I'm, you you wrote the book A New Heart for uh, Nick's New Heart. Uh, how long did that book take for you to write? <laughs> Too long. Um, the uh, uh, both both getting to writing it and both writing it. I, I started I started messing with it and and thinking about you know I need to write this book about Nick when when he was maybe two years old I, just after transplant because i thought you know there's nothing out there for me to read about other families experiences and. I, that I need to be sharing mine with other other parents. And then, you know, time goes by. You don't know how to write a book. You don't know anybody else that's written a book to ask and, and so on and so forth. So um, a really a lot of time went by from between that and the time I guess Nick was 16 or 17. I, I had all those kids to raise. Um, and I, um, and Nick was in and out of the hot, you know, he was six, uh, and having to go to the hospital and that sort of stuff in between there. And, um, finally, I, a, uh, a lady moved to town and, and I don't live in a very large town. And, um, she started a critique group and a writing group. And a friend told me about it and I went and I said, okay, it was time. Uh, I have one kid who had started college and the, and the other three at home. And um, remember I said they were close together. So that was like four teenagers. So um, I had reached the point that I didn't care whether they ate or they were clothed or not. That was all their business. Uh, because they would, they didn't like what I cooked and they didn't like what I did anyway. So I started, I started working on Nick's book and, um, and because of that critique group and because of, of, uh, of the lady, I, um, I put together a decent book, knew nothing about writing a book other than it had words in it and a cover. That was my sum, you know, total. So um, through that critique group and trial and error, I I started sending out, um, re, um, you know, the manuscript. I got lots of rejections, lots and lots and lots. And then I hit on the right small press. And that was the best thing that could have happened to the book because I got to have a say in everything. And, you know, we were, the book is about my family. It's, it's about, it's got Nick's name on it, but it's about my family. And so um, I put out the first edition when Nick was 18. Um, there's a picture of him in it where he's graduating from high school. But then for Nick's 25th anniversary of his heart transplant, I did a second edition. And by that time, he was married and had a child. And um, the um, that one, I thought I would just fly through at those extra 20,000 words. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, it was it was pretty emotional and I'd have to stop 
and think about it. And, and so, um, you know, I ended up with a, a nice size, uh, uh, book that, uh, with the exception of this most recent, um, cancer, uh, issue is all in the book. So that, that must've took you for a real loop, right? First the heart, now cancer. Oh yes. And, and I, the, the biggest issue with um, Nick being sick now is the, you know, when he was a baby, I, I didn't know whether, do you pray for him to die as a child and not, not suffer and not, not, uh, become a member of the family to lose him later. And now, you know, um, Nick's health um, affects not only his dad and I, but his brothers and his sisters um, who who know him and, and his friends and his, and his cousins and his wife and child and um, the, um, the, the, uh, pool of influence is so much larger than it was when he was just a baby. And um, so, you know, when Nick gets sick, it, it, it worries, it worries a lot, a lot, a lot larger group than it, than, uh, than it did. Yeah. And that, that does make it tough. Um, the, uh, his siblings look to me for, um, how are things um, and how worried should we be? Not that they don't look to their dad, but their dad hides it better than I do. And, um, and so, um, yeah, that, that'll always, that's going to be an ongoing concern forever. But um, I told, uh, I worried more about Nick worrying about himself and yeah. that back to the, the, the part about enjoying the moments I told him, I said, you know, he's worried about his daughter growing up without him and that sort of stuff. And I said, honey, you've got, you're going to miss the good stuff. If you spend your time dwelling on the bad or what could be, you know, cause nothing says that, that you're not going to, to live to see her get married or, or whatever it is that, that you're wanting. I said, soak up what you can, you know, while you can and, uh, and not, not worry about the, the future, you know, so any more than you have to. Uh. <laughs> well, as a mom, it's gotta be hard, you know, uh, you gotta be that tough root for everybody, right? So uh, yeah, I think you do. I think you do. Uh, I think, um, you know, people are not, not that Nick's dad doesn't, is not, um, uh, good and supportive, but I, I think, um, that, that moms have to have the stiff upper lip for a lot. I do. Yeah. We have to be the root, the root of the tree, right? And yeah. all the little branches and, and yeah. one cracks a little bit, then we got to get, you know, that band aid and wrap it and fix it and, and oh, hold yeah. it, right? Oh yeah. So where do you get your strength from Susan? Well, God, for, for the starters. Yeah, that, that's my, that's my, uh, that's my main source. And, um, and my husband and I, um, we make a really good team. I tend to be, um, he, uh, the glass half full person. And he says, I live with the rose colored glasses and he's the glass half empty. And, and, um, here's what they're actually saying, not what I, I want them to be saying, um, a lots of times. And, uh, uh, Nick, Nick is really, um, he likes for me not to worry. So he calls now that he's much older, he calls on, he'll tell his dad something and his dad will know it for three or four days before I do, you know, they'll, they tell me the, um, at the last minute because he doesn't want me to worry about it. And uh, he doesn't like for me to be, you know, upset. And, um, and I will say, I tend to know more about what's going on hospital wise and doctor wise, because I, one thing is I pay a lot of attention to it, you know, even 
on newscast and stuff like that. But also, um, you know, I would I was the one doing all of the medical taking care of stuff, you know. So well, Susan, let's get into your tea because the tea you gave me was tenaciously encouraging owner donor and acceptance. Tell me why you gave me those words. <laughs> Well, I am tenacious. I don't give up when I've made up my mind. And I think um, I, not, when you've got a kid that's chronically ill, I think you have to be tenacious. You have to be the advocate for the child and, and the advocate for yourself and the advocate for your family. Um, I, I remember the first time I told him at the hospital and it took years. Now I'm talking about five and six years that they told me when to show up at the hospital and they told me what to do. And it was a big deal when I told them the first time I said, you know, we can't make it that day. We're, we've got a swimming party. We're supposed to be, can we come the next day? And um, because they, at the hospital, they had controlled our, not just mine and Nick's life, but the whole family's life because we, couldn't do something. It all revolved around, around that. So, um, that, but I am tenacious about what I want. I got for this book, I had over 300 rejections before I found a publisher. I was determined that the book needed to be out in the world and it needed to be there, you know, to help others and, uh, for, and, and to encourage others for, um, them to, uh, know that you can survive and thrive as a, as a boy and as a family you know, with all of this going on in your life. And, um, and we have done that. So, and um, encouraging organ donation. Um, my child wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for an organ donor, a family who had had, a, had another child who, who was injured and uh, well, it, had been pronounced dead and was dead that his, his heart saved my child. Um, and 33 years, almost 34 years later, that heart still beats in my child. And if Nick hadn't have gotten a heart transplant, he would not be alive today. There is no doubt about it. Um, so um, I encourage people to donate their organs and that it's a, that it's a good thing. And, and, uh, and it's a positive thing. Um, and, uh, some people say, Ooh, I wouldn't ever do that. But if you're not alive and your, and your organs can benefit somebody else and save their lives, my child certainly is an example of that happening. And I know many, many, many more like him, uh, both children and adults. And, um, and I don't know a single one of them that's not grateful either, eternally grateful uh, that, um, on that. And for acceptance, I think um, acceptance is to, um, to accept what your life has given you and make the most of it, to, uh, to find joy in it and be happy and, um, and, and find the positive side of it is um, what I think of with, um, with in this particular use of acceptance um, and, um, and make the most of it. Smile a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Smiling to, you know, I, we said this the other day with another guest, I forget what guest was on, but we were talking about just smile through it all. Right. Cause life, sometimes life gets so heavy. You just got to smile. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you can look around and find things to make you feel bad. I, I mean, if that's where you want to go, but um, I, I, being happy is often, sometimes being happy is really a choice and you can get, as I tell my children, I, you know, go get happy, you know, um, I can, I can make you unhappy, but you can go get happy too, you know, and, and often I think happiness comes from if you find that you're unhappy, go find somebody you can help and it will make you happy. Yeah. Yeah. But, Susan, let's but, go back to the owner donors. Uh, are you an owner donor of your organs? I am an organ donor. I was an organ donor before Nick. 
um, and my husband was too. So those were not hurdles that we had to overcome. Um, the um, in in America, you can uh, put that you want to be an organ donor on your driver's license, and but they still will ask the family. The family gets the final word. Um, the license just is an indication of what you want to do. 95% of the time I'm um, get and um, but they'll come to the family and um, if uh, I encourage people to talk to their family that's the main thing you can do is to talk to your family and tell them how you feel about organ donation and how you would um, like your organs to um, be used um, in case and you know you think that's a gruesome uh, I, well, I guess it is a gruesome subject, but uh, um, the, uh, you know, it's like talking about your will or how you want your estate to be done. Just because you talk about it doesn't mean you're going to die the next day, but it's so much nicer for your family if you do talk about it and say how you feel. And um, I, um, I, you know, that wasn't even an issue for us in any form about uh, of whether or not uh, having a heart transplant or accepting an organ or whether or not, you know, we could donate, you know, donate ours. And yeah. uh, at one time I had even thought I was going to uh, donate a kidney um, anonymously. And that does happen. And um, but Nick and I are the same blood type and Nick's doctors encouraged me to keep mine in case he ever um, if he were to need it. So yeah. but otherwise, I would have donated anonymously. That, well, I think uh, those are good conversations to bring to the table, Susan, you know, is how these conversations. Yes, they're uncomfortable and yes, they're gruesome and it. it and like you said, you're not going to die the next day, but at least it brings some peace to the family knowing what you want when you're passing or when you're gone. You know, uh, you mentioned that you can put organ donors on your license and your family has a say. If you have that conversation with your children and your family members, then they at least they know that, yes, that is what you wanted, you know, um, and so it doesn't make it complicated because I'm sure there's families that will say, well, no, that's not happening. And then you're not getting the wish that you wanted as a living being. I, I agree. I agree. And I and and they found that if you do, even if uh, other family members don't agree with it, in general for them, but if you want it and that's what you've requested, then they they feel compelled um, for uh, to do it. And I think that's a that's a very um, I think it's a work. It, I, I know it's a worthwhile conversation to have um, and um, something. And, and a lot of people don't know the truth about organ donation. They, um, you know, they think, well, they'll just, they won't take care of me in the hospital if they find out I'm an organ donor. That's the furthest thing from the truth that you can get, you know. And they think it just, you know, you watch too many gruesome movies and uh, or that, <laughs> that are so long, you know, but the movie part is wrong. But, you know, um, the fact that it says horror flick up there that goes by their, you know, over their heads. Yeah. So, but yeah, they uh, don't look at the patient and say, oh, no, this one's an organ one. Let's just get in the. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. And it, 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 there's there's rules and laws and procedures that are uh make it um make it as fair as possible and and um and may, um and uh, those are constantly changing and um about trying to make it fairer and how and how uh how they're how they're done and and uh and 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 it's scrutinized to the nth degree it truly is yeah so susan did you guys get to meet the family who gave the heart to Nick? We did not. That was their choice. Um, things are a lot more open now about uh, meeting organ donors and families than it was um, 33 years ago. Um, Nick was one of the first um, 
150 uh, children in the United States to receive an org, uh, a heart transplant. So, um, and an even smaller group was under the age of two. So um, th we're talking about pretty cutting edge uh, tra uh, tra pediatric transplants. Now adults have been done uh, much longer, but um, at the time you were allowed to know the age, race, and sex of the, of the uh, donor. And uh, we could write a letter and I wrote a letter and the letter was sent through the um, the organ procurement agency in in my state, and um, but that that family never responded. But there's not an anniversary of Nick's heart transplant that doesn't go by that I don't say a prayer for that that family, um, because what is a, um, a celebratory day for my for us? It is a um, is a memory for them, and uh, you know, and it's a sad day for them. But um, but we're very uh, appreciative uh, of yeah. of them. So, um, but uh, they never have responded. I don't know that the I I assume they've read the letter, but they would have had a choice of whether or not they even got a they even took the letter or not. And, um, but after I sent it in, that's all that, um, that, that I got to know about it. So, so Susan, have you connected with other family members who have had children have heart transplants? Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they, um, especially when Nick was younger, um, the, uh, they would get the heart transplant children together. The hospital would, and, um, they would also, he would go to camp with um with children that had heart had heart transplants and um and I also um actually Nick's donor saved two children's lives that day. Nick got the heart and um one little girl got the liver and uh Nick and she um were friends for a good long time. He hasn't seen her in a while but um but you know they were two children that were saved by one uh, organ donor. And um, so, oh yeah. And it um, it's a bittersweet group to be with um, and to know because, um, you know, a number of them have not, don't have not lived. Um, you know, they, uh, um, and uh, a, with those, you know, I had to tell Nick, or, or he, in some cases, he would tell me, um, you know, as social media became more of a thing. And, um, but, um, yeah, and I'm still in contact with some of them. Yeah, sure am. So it's a, it's an interesting group to be a member of, I will say. <laughs> well, well it, it's, it's lives living within each other, right? It's different organs that are being passed on to another child, another family member, uh, you know, yeah. uh, the stories and the connections and the relationships. I'm sure that unless you live it, you don't understand it, but it's that special unity, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, and you definitely need it. And that was part of what uh, uh, Nick's New Heart was about is that, you know, we need we need to know we're not the only one out there. Yeah, uh, that that uh, that there's somebody else that's experiencing at least part of what we are or yeah. um, and and learning from them, uh, you know, hey, what did you do in this situation? And um, would you you know, would you do that again or do something different? So um, all of that is uh, um, we need that support. You do. You de most definitely do. So Susan, does Nick share his story? He does. He's not really, he does it as much as I do. Um, but now he doesn't remember though, you know, certainly doesn't remember those early years where things were super dramatic and then uh, not, but he does remember when he had the aorta uh, uh, replacement and, and certainly cancer. He, um, He's very judicious about how he shares it. Even at work, he says um, he'll tell the people that work around him, 
you know, look, I've had a heart transplant. If you don't, you know, don't see me in a timely manner, come hunt me, um, that sort of thing. And um, a couple of years ago, he he was in the management program at Walmart and, you know, and, and every, all the managers have to take their turn on doing nothing but night shift. And, um, but at night he wouldn't, sit, there would maybe be five other people in the whole store with him and he might not see anybody for hours on end. And he had a little health scare and he decided that was not what he needed to be doing because he said, you know, if something happened to me, um, nobody would find me for hours yeah. and, and all. So he made it, he made a job change, which Walmart was Walmart's been horror. I mean, they're just really been very supportive um, all along. So, um, and which I thought he was smart to do and recognize at, yeah. that to uh, um, for that. But, um, but now he would be in a crowd of people and you would never know it. He's not, He's not uh, very demonstrative about it. No. Yeah. Well, th and that's the thing, right? A lot of people don't know someone's story because they just look at it and they're like, oh, you're fine. You're walking, you're talking. You're so they don't know. know the hidden story right behind it. Um, yes. And the reason that I really wanted to have you on Tea Time when you reached out to me, Susan, is because we need the awareness on transplants and organ donors and stuff because those are conversations we don't have, you know? Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, I know I can go and stand in a group of people and probably tell you if they have heart problems uh, or, um, or a heart transplant or, you know, especially a group of kids because I know what to look for. But the average person doesn't. And that's a double edged sword. You know, uh, it's kind of it's good to go and not always be that one that's um, that has that's standing out in the crowd or has got an issue and kids and teenagers especially don't want to do that. But on the flip side, I think I've always taught Nick, uh, he had a responsibility to share his story um, to, because it um, people, they needed to hear it and be encouraged by it and know, you know, Hey, organ donation works and and that part he does but not so much like on a program with you and me like this yeah. as much as a very subtle one-on-one -on -one. and and um you know they're always impressed with him uh even even the medical even medical personnel who uh have been at it for a long time still go oh wow really you know, and, uh, us, you know, at the adult, <laughs> the adult, uh, when he went to the adult hospital, he said, there's a man sitting beside him at the clinic and, and the man's just talking and said, yeah, I've had a heart transplant and, and, uh, said, and looked over at Nick and said he was maybe, you know, 60 or so. And, looked over at Nick and said, well, you know, what are you here for? And Nick said, well, I've had a heart transplant. He says, oh, really? He said, I've had mine for six years, you know, like he had really done something. Nick said, well, I've had mine for 24. And the man goes, oh, you know, the reality, you know, Nick's the, a baby in an adult world at 35 still, because that's still a tends to be an older person's um, thing to, to yeah. need an organ, you know, to uh, need an organ donation. But the, um, but you know, that those for Nick, those are kind of fun moments because he does get the, so, you know, he doesn't say anything else and they, Oh, really? <laughs> you, know? you get that. Oh, wow. Really? How old yeah. are you? Like, you know, yeah. and it opens the conversation, right? It opens oh, yeah. that connection. And, yeah. and then you just realize, okay, to 25 years, six years, and then they kind of share notes back and forth. Right. Um, the transplant, there's also a rejection of the organ as well. Susan, was there any rejection of this heart with Nick? Well, um, the only time he had, um, any major um, rejection was when he was um, uh, 13 years old 
and he um he uh and I mean, I came unglued because we had had, he had had such good things, but I, and I asked the cardiologist, I said, Dr. Vincent, why, it, you know, now? And he said, oh, it's because he's a teenager and his hormones are changing. And I went, <laughs> I told him, I said, I'm, I'm, it's time for me to go through menopause and I got all this other stuff going on. You got to come across with something better than my life. I mean, that's, that's not going to come. I'm not taking a teenager thing. <laughs> no. That, but it, the next one, it, they made a medicine adjustment and the neck and watched it really closely. And, and uh, he didn't have any uh, other uh, problem. But the thing about rejection is you have acute and you have chronic rejection. And acute re uh, rejection is what what you have that's, uh, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten years out from our, uh, a transplant. After that, it turns into chronic rejection, which is not so much the your body rejecting your or your organs per se as we think about it. It is um, the changes in your um, your body and your heart. Um, in Nick's case, um, hardening of the arteries, which is an old person's disease, um, his, it has started a lot faster with him than it would have, it would in a normal person. So um, he's got five stents in, in an artery of his heart um, uh, because of that and takes a medicine because of that of that. So chronic rejection is what um, we look at now um, or, or more concerned about than that actual, you know, his body's gotten used to the heart. It's just a matter of keeping those tweaks all straightened out um, the best yeah. we can. Yeah. So, so can he uh, have rejections today as well? Um, actually, they don't do they don't do rejection tests for him anymore. They do oh. heart they they do heart catheterizations and um and check his and to check his arteries and that's what they're looking for um, now. So because they you generally don't reject you die you die of some other issue. Um, okay. That, instead of um, the acute re, um, rejection, yeah. So, so Susan, if anybody wanted to get this book, where could they get this book? Uh, you can look, you can go on my website, uh, which is uh, for this one is susancmay.com. Uh, you can go on Amazon and look for Nick's New Heart, 30 Years and Counting. And um, the um, and um, if you can contact me, if you'd like to have a autographed one that uh and to get one so but it's full of pictures and um and family anecdotes and this one on the second edition i interviewed my children and my husband and the doctors um and you know for what they were thinking at the time so um a little a little more in depth uh from a larger group and and not just from uh, strictly from my point of view. So, and Susan, which one was harder to write, the first one or the second? I think the first one probably, just because I, I the first, <laughs> back to that critique group, I took in my first few pages and we, you would read it out loud and then they would, um, they would go through it and make notes and then talk to you about it. And I, I thought, oh, I had done such a brilliant job. And, <laughs> you know, as, as all writers do initially. And they, they said, is this supposed to read like a, a newspaper article? And that was the last thing I wanted it to read like. And uh, they said, you've got to put a little more emotion. And it was really hard because I always had to keep digging for that emotion. And I didn't want to go to that pl emotional place anymore. I had already gone through it once. I didn't want to revisit it. So on that aspect, it made it a lot harder. Yeah, 
it did. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd write a little bit, cry a little bit, write a little bit and cry a little bit. But um, I really was, uh, am quite proud of it because Nick was reading it. And uh, he said, I'm reading along and I'm feeling really sorry for this little boy. And I'm wondering, you know, how's he going to make it? And, and how awful is this? And he says, well, that was me. And I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so you was, wrote it in a way that he could understand the story as well. Yeah, yeah. And and this was when he was in high school. So, you know, he knew he had made it out of out of, you know, the at least the first three or four chapters. He said after that, I knew it all. You know, I could he could remember most of that after that. But he, but, you know, that initial stuff. And he was thinking, man, I don't know if this kid's going to make it. And I realize it's me, you know. <laughs> Well, that's always good when you you know yeah. when they read the story and they, and then they get to see your point of view as well, right? And what you went through and the emotions that mom went through. Uh, I think it's important to have the parents' stories out there. You know, we hear the survivors and the people who live it, but to hear from a parent's voice, it it it's impactful too. Yes, I agree. It, it and it and I tell you what, I think it's really good also for. Um, nurses and doctors that work with uh, chronically ill children to uh, realize um, that the, the part that they don't realize that the parents are going through and um, or um, how parents react to things that are said and done, um, good and bad, because uh, I could I wouldn't trade Nick's health care um, with for anything. I mean, he had lovely doctors and nurses that that loved on him in the hospital but loved on him at birthday parties and you know came to his wedding and um you know pr still participate in his life and so um from that aspect but I can remember that they would read it and go I didn't know that we didn't you know we didn't realize that was you know going on and uh, so um, it has a, I think I, it has a good circle for everybody. You know, yeah. to, well, it to, gives a voice for a parent, right? Especially if a parent yeah. is trying to understand their feelings and why they had this frustration and this fear and, the, you know, the anger, because I'm sure there was anger at some point as well during this time in your life as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you would, um, or um, also why, uh, they're feeling that emotionally or, or uh, at that time and how uh, just approaching um, a, a parent when this is going on, what they need. And uh, so many times um, that uh, more than once, uh, Nick and I would be at the hospital for him for, him for a checkup. Sometimes we made special trips uh, down, but, uh, the parents just needed to see of newborn babies just needed to see that Nick was alive and had walked into the room because that made them think, well, if that, if he can do it, then my child can do it. And that was all they did. They didn't want to ask any questions. They just needed to see him um, alive and well, you know, that it made, the, it made a difference um, for them. So, um, and that, that's important, but Nick has lived, lived an exceptionally long time, um, with his heart and, um, uh, the, uh, and it, you know, he's had, he's had his bumps, but he's still, he's still ticking. His sister says he's, um, if they had the atomic bomb, it'd be Nick and the cockroaches. They just, they weren't going to. You know, he'd make it no matter, <laughs> just keep <on>. saying. <laughs> Since you mentioned his sister, how did his siblings feel about everything Nick's been through? Um, you know, I, we were, I, and I, both of us, my husband, a real strong proponent of keeping things as n uh, normal as possible. And I know that sounds weird after I've told you Nick's story, but um, I, I, I worked very hard for them not to miss birthday parties or do anything that 
they thought was fun or wanted to do because of their brother so that they would not resent him. And um, so, and I think, I think we succeeded um, there. Um, the, um, because they do not see him as my favorite. They all think my oldest son is my favorite. They, you know, it's this, they're in their late thirties and early my kids 40s. are the same way, Susan. <laughs> Fighting over who's the favorite. And so, but, and surprisingly, it's not the baby with the sick, sick baby that was considered the favorite. It was the older one. So I, we maybe have overdone it on that. But, um, you know, they they knew they had a brother who was sick that had a bad heart. Uh, but we still went on vacations. We still did things. Um, it, I, I, ne I tried very hard. I'm sure it came out of my mouth, but almost never that we can't do it because Nick is sick or we can't do it because Nick has to go to the hospital. I would always give some alternative to, um, that, well, well, we can't do it on Wednesday, but maybe we can do that on Friday you know, yeah. the, that type of thing. So, um, I, so there, there wasn't any resentment and I, to this day, I, I mean, I don't think there is, uh, uh, there, if there's anything, there's concern, uh, out of them and, um, the, um, and they're, they take it in stride. That's all they've ever known. Um, so, you know, I guess if he had gotten sick, say when he was, you know, 10 or 12, things might have been different in that world, yeah. but they were still small enough and uh, young enough, they were just raised with it. So it's a fact of life for them, like it's a fact of life for Nick. Yeah. So Susan, besides writing Nick's story, you've written many books. Uh, I want to get that out there before we wrap up uh, and, and let people know that you have other books out there. Uh, and we talked about it before we went live. You just came back from Canada after uh, celebrating with the, the Har Harlequin. Uh, you can share a little bit about that before we wrap up. Um, I write Harlequin romances, medical romances. You know, you write what you know. And I started out with one medical about a little boy who needed a heart transplant. Imagine that. And um, I've written, um, I'm thir just turned in my 39th. And so um, I um, I write under the Susan Carlisle. The um, the nonfictions are under uh, Susan May, but the um, the romances are under Susan Carlisle. And um, I uh, Harlequin celebrated their 75th anniversary, and so um, and I've been with them about 23 years. So I am. Um, clicking along pretty good. I am bumping really close to 50 books. So that's uh, that um, for overall with my fictions and my nonfictions. And you can find me at susancarlisle.com and at susancmay.com. So before we wrap up, I asked you to give me one word to describe yourself and you gave me dependable. Why did you give me that word, Susan? Well, I was most dependable in high school and I still am dependable. I, um, I'm a real organized person, but, uh, and I, therefore that makes me dependable. I believe in list and marking list off, but, uh, I generally, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. So that, that makes me pretty dependable. <laughs> so Susan, what's your final message for everybody today? Um, a, a organ donation saves lives and um and smile through it all i love it well thank you so much susan for joining me on tea time and sharing nick's story and sharing your book and i would love a signed copy so we will talk about that after we're done the live uh and i want to thank all the listeners and the viewers out there i could not do this without you we all do this together it's teamwork so when you listen and you share and you reshare and you watch the replays it's a teamwork so that's what we do is we share a team of tea over on tea time with miss liz uh 
I will be back tonight at 7 p.m. with J.M. Shaw, and we'll be talking about her Callum Walker series books and autism and AHD and being diagnosed as an adult. So we'll be talking about that stuff as well. So tune in at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tonight. Until then, I want to wish everybody an awesome day and keep sharing your teas. Keep being true to yourself, and we will make a difference one cup of tea at a time.